Amateur detectives think that they have found the legendary D.B. Cooper. He's the skyjacker, of course, that jumped out of a jetliner back in 1971 with $200,000 in ransom. Well, Cooper commentators fall into two groups. Those who believe he survived the jump, those who believe he perished. The survivalists argue there is no physical evidence of his death. And uh, two local sleuths say there's plenty to prove that Cooper is still alive. Coin News 6 reporter Mike Donahue examines their theory. Skydivers more than once have recreated Dan Cooper's jump off the rear stairs of a 727 and safely made it to the ground. Those who led the original search for the skyjacker assumed he made it down alive. Definitely. There are several law enforcement officers here who belong to uh, or have done some skydiving. And at that speed and altitude, uh, no problem. At Skydive Oregon, experts showed me a 28-foot-long parachute like the one Cooper used and a thin jumpsuit they use at even higher altitudes. The speed and the temperature wouldn't have killed him. No, I don't think so. Um, the speed and the temperature shouldn't have been an issue at all. Hey, don't try the fence down there. Come on through here. An 18-day search of the suspected drop zone found no trace of Dan Cooper or his parachute. No evidence of his demise. Just not. Even Ralph Himmelsbach, the retired FBI agent in charge, who thinks the skyjacker was killed, admits he can't prove it. If there'd have been a parachute down there out exposed, I think we'd have seen it. A parachute's a pretty big piece of nylon, and uh, there hasn't even been so much as a belt buckle found. Matt Myers and Dan Dvorak have made a hobby of researching the Cooper case. Conventional wisdom plots the night diver's landing in a remote forest but they place him closer to civilization. Recently, the pilot of Flight 305, William Scott, admitted he did not stay on the Seattle to Portland flight path, that hand-flying the plane, he drifted away from the Lewis River, closer to the Washougal River, upstream from Vancouver, where some of the ransom money was found. I think there's a very good possibility that he landed in the general area where the money was found. In 1980, the Ingram family, on a picnic, uncovered almost $6,000 worth of Cooper's 20s while digging a fire pit in a Columbia River beach. So you paint planes? I paint airplanes a little bit, yeah. I like. Pilot and expert parachutist Ted Mayfield also knows a lot about Dan Cooper's jump. If you give him the airspeed, the altitude, all he had to do was time it. And he knew exactly where he was getting out, within, I would say, within a five-mile radius. He knows that, say Dvorak and Myers, because in their opinion, he is Dan Cooper, the legendary hijacker living in Sheridan, Oregon. Did they ever suspect it might be you? Well, the, other than the fact I was covered because they called me on the phone, and they talked to me on the phone actually three times. That was your alibi. The yeah. me, and then once at my girlfriend's house. Uh, he and I don't have exactly the same memory, uh, because I never did call him. Himmelsbach remembers Mayfield calling him once, and because of that call... I just have to feel that I'm his alibi. An investigator is, is human. Uh, they, can, they can set up a paradigm just like anybody else. They believe Himmelsbach overlooked Mayfield as a suspect because the call came less than two hours after Cooper jumped. Cell phones didn't exist then. But if, as Mayfield claims, Cooper came down within five miles of his target, he could have walked to a payphone in one hour. Because yeah. you're sure it's a detailed plot. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think this man knew exactly right down to the T. Yeah. You know? It wasn't just blind luck. Oh, it was not blind luck. That man knew ahead of time what he was going to do. Knowledge is one thing, but does Ted Mayfield fit the hijacker's profile? The mystery continues tomorrow. Mike Donahue, Coin News 6.